Hello, I'm Doug Musio. This is City Talk. Gadfly, a person who annoys others, especially by rousing them from complacency. But unlike the lonely voice in the wilderness, this gadfly's voice is heard on the radio. It's in newspapers, in magazines, and on TV, and in the subways, always in the subways. And this gadfly's got sting. When he talks, people listen. They learn, and hopefully, they shape up. Here with us today to inform us and to shake us out of our complacency is Gene Rushinov, staff attorney for NYPIRG, New York State's largest student-directed consumer, environmental, and governmental reform organization. Gene also serves as staff attorney to NYPIRG's Strap Hangers campaign. Gene, welcome. Thanks for the great introduction. Uh, well deserved. Let's start with a question that I know that you've been asked. Why the delays? Why the fires? What is amiss here? What's yeah, going on? We've heard that question a lot, and I'm afraid that it's really tough to answer. Sometimes things come in a big wave, and there's no controlling it. The subways are 100 years old. This is their centennial anniversary. And unless you invest huge sums of money in them, you're going to see derailments and fires and problems. And uh, we've, uh, the, good, the good news is that the MTA takes it really seriously. They know that they are not loved. Uh, by their customers. And so they've gone about trying to do things like making the subways cleaner and addressing some of the problems. Uh, you know, it's a bureaucracy, so how well they're going to do, I don't know, but they're more open. So that when we put out our report on subway dirt, on schmutz, uh, they, uh, it was for the first time in maybe, I know, 15 years I've been doing the reports, they agreed. Their own studies showed internally that things were getting dirtier and that the riders were noticing it. So. I felt, I felt good that we were able to sort of push them to agree that they needed to do more in the cleanliness area. One of the things, and I want to talk about the strap hangers, both their strategies and tactics in a bit, but let's go to the subway schmutz, which, you know, I just love yeah. it. The interesting thing is that you don't have only an adversarial relationship and an antagonistic relationship with the MT. There's some symbiosis here. There's some synergy, and they begin to realize that you're really providing them a service. Particularly, you guys do what a lot of advocacy groups don't do. You do your homework. You're in the sub I see you in the subway all the time. You're counting. You've got data, and it is well analyzed and well presented. What ge just generally talk about how the MTA perceives you? Well, you know, it, it's funny. I mean, we're, some days we're the best of friends, some days we're the worst of enemies. And uh, some, we have a real identity of interest when it comes to them getting more money because you can't make subways better and buy new cars and buses and fix track unless you have the dough. It just doesn't happen. And, and you, that's very political. It's up to the state legislature and the mayor and the governor working together. And we can say things about all those characters that the MTA is really constrained mm -hmm. in, what the, in what they say. Uh, you know, and then some days, you know, we're a big pain in the rear end. I mean, the, the Schmutz studies, we, we started doing them because they cut the number of cleaners. And my, my view of the world is if you cut what you have, you run the risk that things are going to get worse. Sure. And they said they were going to do more with less. That's always the mantra right. of government. And right. so we discovered through our reports that they were doing less with less. And it took, you know, uh, seven reports for them to finally agree that there was a problem. So I, I feel grateful about that. But for us, the reports are a way uh, for the public. They're done by volunteers to mm -hmm. go out and rate the system and put some of their energy to use uh, when, you know, they feel just so frustrated about the conditions that they confront. Let's talk about fiscal and Albany. The, the budget has been passed, quote unquote, we've got a budget. Look at the state budget. Look at the funding for the MTA. What are we getting that we deserve? What are we getting that we need? And what aren't we getting from well, them? Just lay out a broad picture for well, us. You know, for an advocate like me, you know, you sort of settle for, for a decent result, not a perfect mm -hmm. result. So this go-round, they have what's called the five-year rebuilding program. 
And in 2000, the program was funded by borrowing an astonishing sum of money, $22 billion. And the payments on those bonds have come due when it's about 20 percent of the fare is just to pay off the debt mm -hmm. from the last program to, uh, to fix the system, to buy cars, to make stations better. Which and, you and strap hangers perceive to have been absolutely necessary for the well, system. We, yes, but we, we ranted and raved about the borrowing. And, okay. and, and, and also so did every newspaper in town and people from the right to the left because they knew that uh, borrowing and spending was worse than taxing and spending and that the, the, the impact was going to hit us for like years and years to come. They're going to 20 percent of their budget on borrowing for probably the next 20 years. So, again, the predisposition to push everything out to the next generation, yeah, have yeah, our kids yeah. and our grandkids pay and not pay a political right. price. And, and so in this plan, the legislature did something unbelievable, which is that they passed $330 million of new taxes and fees to cover some of the new bonds that will be issued, about $5 billion. And there are other things I could talk about. They were supposed to sell the stadium for a good land. Well, we're stadium. going to talk about the stadium. Uh, so, I don't so, want to. So, uh, so in that way, I felt good about it. But, but the truth is, is that the MTA has a fiscal crisis, which Controller Havasi has reported on. They borrowed a lot of money. They, they raised the fare twice in a year and a half. Uh, they cut service. And there have been threats of additional service cuts next year, which would be unbelievable. Controller Havasi says they're not necessary, but they're talking about 95 bus routes wouldn't have night service, and they'd eliminate 33 buses, including the one I take my kids to school on sometimes. And so there's a lot of anger out there. And so uh, they're going to need more money, and whoever becomes governor in the 2006 elections is going to face real challenges to keep the system going. Talk bucks. I mean, how much is actually the state putting into the system, particularly in capital, because that seems to be where the major budgetary shortfall between what the advocates of the system see it needing and the MTA often sees itself needing and what the legislature gave them. Well, the, you know, there are a lot of statistics. I mean, the most important one to me is that uh, the subways move about 84 percent of the state's yearly riders. And we only get 63% of the dough from Albany. So, again, we've got this it's mismatch like the, it's like the, school, it's the school system. And, you know, you see the suburbs, they, get, they move about 6% of the riders and they get 23% of the dough. And that's what happens when you have a, a suburban and urban system together and that's where the power is. So that's, that's an unfairness. A lot of the toll money from the city, the Verrazano Bridge and the Triborough, all goes out to the island of Westchester and they've done really well because of it. So, so, again, the city is an exploited colony sending our well, riches I mean, the, out. I, I, you know, the things I just said were said by candidate Bloomberg when he was running for office. Right. But, you know, once you get in there, you sort of shrug your shoulders and say, well, I'm not going to change this. And besides, I get no credit uh, for the subway except if I build a new line like the 7. So, you know, maybe I'll take the subway in the morning and look really good. But am I going to really fight to get more money for the system? And I think, uh, unfortunately, this mayor is like his predecessors. In the end, they see the MTA as a a place to go to get money, not a place to go to help out. So again, okay, let's 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 be let's target the mayor here. The mayor, I'm hearing you saying that he hasn't fought for this transit system, well, and in fact, it's part of his speak softly and carry a big carrot approach well, to state government. At best, he has a mixed record, but I think it's mixed to poor. For example. Uh, the city usually gives about $100 million a year to the MTA's rebuilding program. Mm -hmm. That's about half a billion bucks over a five-year plan. Right. It's very little to begin with. This mayor has cut that. He's the first mayor in 25 years. He's now giving about $75 million a year. And, that, and when you have to do the math, the city's giving about $100 million less to the rebuilding program. And that's going to just hurt the system. And uh, so... Uh, uh, and uh, there was a big fight over the private bus routes, the ones right. that go to Queens, Bronx, and right. Brooklyn. And um, the city now gives $150 million bucks a year to subsidize those systems. And the mayor fought for two years to give the sub privates to the MTA and not pay any subsidy. And so that's what mayors always trying to do. Giuliani tried to get out from under student fares, and uh, he got uh, you know, whacked by, by trying to do it. And uh, you know, I wish the mayor would put more of his money where his mouth is about decent transit. So your, your, your thesis is since they are insulated by this authority yes. that they don't have any political will or guts and they're not made well, to face up to these realities because they don't have to pay for it. it. Maybe it's a little more complicated than that. Most, most New Yorkers blame the mayor whether, whether, or, okay. or credit the mayor for changes in the subways, even if it's really the governor 
Uh, you know, like MetroCard, if you do polls, most people think they were like Giuliani's idea, and he had absolutely nothing to do with it. You guys fought for a long uh, and, time. And Pataki made, you know, I said, you know, I can criticize him too, but he, he made them, he forced the transit bureaucrats. And a public authority, you know, in my view, it does shield the politicians, uh, but it's influenceable by the governor and the mayor, the boards are appointed by right. them, and they just have to be strong-willed and, and really push, which they 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 often don't don't do. And uh, for example, when the legislature passed the capital program for the uh, transit authority, uh, they didn't tell us what the cuts would be. So we waited till you know several weeks, and they put out a list. And they're cutting 12 subway stations, the rehabs around the city. And they're, to me, they're in prime territory. It was so 71st and uh, 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 Continental Avenue of Forest Hills is cut from the Queens. Program. Sure, they're picking on us. Union again. Turnpike is cut again. Uh, there are five stations in Mensonhurst for a total of 150 million bucks, and a couple in downtown Brooklyn, uh, and one I know really well, Smith 9th Street, the tallest one in the system, which mm -hmm. it looks like someone took the Eiffel Tower and blew it up. I mean, it's just a total, <laughs> it's a total mess. So, uh, you know, I, I, I we'll see what happens publicly, but you know, the mayor should be doing something. He has a vote. He's going to approve these cuts. And there's an obscure board that the mayor sits on. Uh, that will approve whether these cuts go through. And I guess my question is, what are they doing about it? And Talk I'll, about this board. I mean, I don't know this. I mean, this, uh, inform me and the well, audience There's an there. interesting history to this. There's something called the MTA Capital Program Review Board, and the governor, the mayor, and state senate and state assembly sit on it. And any party can veto the plan. It sounds like the Public Authority Control Board, well, which does. we'll talk about with uh, the Jets. But what's interesting is that it was this, it was established in 1981 at the request of the Republicans because the Democrats controlled the MTA and they didn't trust them to spend billions of dollars to fix the system. And here we are, 25 years later, and the Republicans run the system, and so there's still this review board because they just they, you know you need checks and balances in any kind of American government system, uh, and uh, it makes a difference. Now, is this board going to check and balance the MTA? Well, you know, um, uh, uh, Albany, the politics are always complicated. So, <laughs> so, uh, so Inform as me. Assemblywoman Catherine Nolan sits on for the assembly, and she's very concerned about the station cuts. Senator Dean Skelo sits on. He's from the island, and mm -hmm. he's concerned about the service cuts. In particular, they really targeted his district. And, uh, and the mayor's got to be worried about what these station cuts mean. So, I mean, a group like mine, what we do is that we alert people these decisions are being made, whether they be editorial writers or reporters mm -hmm. or the communities that are affected. Uh, we're, we, we're, uh, later this week, we're having a, a negative ribbon cutting at the downtown Brooklyn station. So we, we get the politicians to cut a black ribbon to say the station is not going to get repaired. You know, and we did that back in the 90s when uh, uh, Shelley Silver was still had a ways and means that they weren't going to fix Canal Street. And, you know, he did a negative ribbon cutting and they put Canal Street back on the list. One of the things that I love about the strap hangers is your sense of theater. Now, let me just go through one of them that I really love. In 2000, you guys created a poster <laughs> with crowds crammed into a subway car and the, the tagline was with livestock it's called animal cruelty with people it's called the morning commute now you guys wanted these put in the subway the mta yeah, said no we but you lucky. guys go to the board meetings gagged so your sense of and then it dramatizes the issue in a way that it wouldn't otherwise so it's not only your data and your hard work, but it's also your sense of theater that really captures the issue. You know, uh, this is a sort of a Walter Mitty aspect of the job. We get to do some fun things every once in a while. So, And when we sit around deciding about hearings or events, we always try and do something fun. In 2000, we also wanted to liven one of the uh, MTA uh, fare increase hearings. So we knew there was going to be fare increases months before they happened. And we said, well, we must be psychic. So we gave the board fortune cookies. <laughs> And they, they, they couldn't help themselves. If you give free food to... Right, to, right. To, they'll uh, do it. They'll do it. They open up. And, you know, uh, Virgil Conway was the head of the MTA. And, you know, he was probably like close to 70 at the time. And the fortune he opened up and it said, you know, raising the fair will create havoc with your love life. And so, you know, at least, you know, you have to have a sense of humor because it's just so difficult. Did he laugh? Uh, I think so. <laughs> Uh, I think so. Let's talk. I mean, let's let's jump around here. Let's stick with Conway and Calico. The Peter Calico seems to be much more engaged with the system than Conway. Conway was Pataki's guy. He was a hack in the job. 
Calico well, seems to be. I, I give Calico higher marks, and particularly uh, he had what we would call street cred this uh, last year because right. he, wa he, he said, I need new taxes or I'm going to flop. And for a Republican to say that and put pressure on his own boss, to me, it was an incredible thing. And he won. He got new taxes uh, implemented. And a, a big chunk of what they want to do, like fixing the, exa the existing system is, you know, in place. So uh, I have to give him a lot of credit. And he warned because uh, about the expansion projects. A lot of people would like to see a Second Avenue subway. Right. It was, so would we, and, uh, connecting the Long Island Railroad to Grand Central. Right, we're gonna... and, and he warned that they wouldn't happen unless they got the money. And it's, it, right now, at, the, at this very moment, it's very unclear what's going to happen with the expansion project because they got the short end of the stick. It seems that the chairman, Calico, has become an advocate for the system, which hasn't been the norm. Well, I guess we could go back to Richard Ravitch in the 80s as yeah, an yeah, advocate. I think that's a good analogy. And, and what's also different is that his executive director, Catherine Lapp, is a smart cookie, and uh, you, you know, there's there's a culture to the agency. You know, if you work at the agency, you Talk can't. About it. Well, they believe that there's been tremendous progress since they started rebuilding the system in '81, and new, longtime New Yorkers, maybe grudgingly, would admit that there's you know graffiti's gone, there are new cars, uh, they get bumped off less often, and even with the troubles they experience, it's better than it was 25 years ago. And so everyone's telling Katie that's the way it is, and unless we get what they call the core program, the essential things, cars, buses, they're in big trouble. And so I saw her up in Albany, and she, that was the message she mm -hmm. was delivering. And the end result was that they got uh, about, about $15.4 billion for the core program, and right. they got something like $2.5 billion for their expansion projects, which when you see the math, you see that the core program did much better. And it makes sense because <clears throat> 7 million people are taking the existing system. They'd like to see Second Avenue subway, so would I. Uh, but the real thing is like what the D is going to be today or the number seven. Right. And, the, and it seems as if my, in my amateurs look at uh, Albany that the rest of those capital monies that would build the link from the Long Island Railroad or the Second Avenue subway simply aren't going to be there, certainly in the short term. Well, you know, I, I would say the problem with New York is that we don't have any way of creating a consensus or priorities for these projects. So I could tell you each project has its own what we would call political rabbi. So the governor really wants to connect mm -hmm. Long Island Railroad to Grand Central. And Sheldon for their own Sil political reasons. Well, that would help his base on Long Island. Okay. Uh, Sheldon Silver wants a long time in equity to the Lower East Side, changed by Second Avenue subway. Right. <clears throat> the mayor wants to extend the number seven for his <clears throat> dreams of built, rebuilding the uh, west side of Manhattan. And the Jet Stadium. And, and the Jet Stadium. And, uh, uh, and the downtown real estate moguls really want to connect the new line from Jamaica on the Long Island Railroad to downtown Manhattan. And, and so it's, it's total Darwinism. You know, everybody fights among everybody else. Everybody lobbies the Congress. They must think we're like the Tower of Babel in New York. They just hear about everything all the time from us. And the governor just doesn't set a priority. So, and so, okay, the location of this, if there were to be an individual who had the authority, it would be the governor, but the governor hasn't well, led. Well, you know, and, and, and the model really is San Francisco. They have a, what's called the Metropolitan Transportation Council, one of these obscure bodies that the federal government requires. We have one in New York, which is pretty much defunct, uh, in my opinion. And the one in San Francisco, actually, the stakeholders actually duke it out, and they there's much more of a priority setting, which is why San Francisco built their subway to the airport. And, right. And we're still fighting about, you know, whether the air train will be linked up. So this is not, I mean, this certainly then is not only personal, but this is systemic and structural. Well, during my lifetime, I, you know, we've been in the trenches. For us, the key thing is fixing what we have. Right. And I was convinced in 2000 to support some of the expansion projects because it brings along some of the politicians, it brings along public interest. There's a second half of your subway. It's the most famous thing that's never been built in New York City. I remember driving and, along the washboard. And, and so, it, we, so I, be, I believe that and, uh, and, maybe, and maybe it worked this time too because we got the core program and some, some expansion. I mean, if, they, uh, if you really look at it, you can continue those projects maybe slower, but they don't become just like holes in the ground like they became in the mid-70s. Right. Talk about these various extension programs, and we'll go into this in greater depth in a bit. The, 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 you talked about four of them, I guess. There's the, the extension of the seven, there's the seven, second avenue line, there's the, the Long Island Railroad co connection, and then there's the, the airport to the downtown connection. 
as an advocate, if you were then in a policy-making position, how would you prioritize it and why? Well, to me, there's no question that the Second Avenue subway comes first. It would move 345,000 people. And if the issue is relieving the crowding on the Lex and getting people downtown, the plan they have is to build the first segment for about $3.5 billion on, on Second Avenue and then curve over to the tunnel that now uses the N and the R, and it would right. come all the way downtown. So I think... That's a very good first step. And, and the federal government has rated it, given it's its highest recommendation because it moves so many people. Our, that line probably moves all the people that the federal government's New Starts program around the country would move. Exactly. And, 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 and as, as you know, we've got only one east side line. The Lex Avenue line goes down and the whole east side goes down, well, you except know, where I, the N and the R come down. At the, at, the, well, at the tip of the island. I, I think we have uh, convinced the MTA and Calico about the priorities, uh, but there are other players around. Is that the mayor's priority? No, his priority is extending the number seven. What's the rationale? Well, you know, he, he takes the Lex uh, usually at 6 a.m. when there's nobody on it, so he probably thinks it's a nice, empty, easy ride uh, downtown. Uh, and I don't he didn't think write it to, from to work well, this you know, morning. I, I like, like him I to, did. I'd like him to show up some morning at rush hour and talk to Lex writers at Grand Central and see what he hears from them. Uh, so um, I don't know. I just I think uh, and uh, the downtown people think they can get some money from uh, sources that Second Avenue couldn't get, uh, but I don't think that's true because they pencil in the MTA to, to contribute four hundred million dollars to the downtown link. It's like making a debtor nation uh, promise money. Yeah, but I, I didn't quite understand that. Forcing the MTA to put that money in when it's got other needs, it, it, it's perverse. Well, it, it has an interesting story because the MTA was in really the position to respond to the 9-11 monies. And so uh, they proposed a $400 million rebuild of South Ferry. And a lot of the downtown moguls thought that was just an MTA project, not a downtown project. And I totally disagree. I think it's going to be a great thing for downtown. And so the view of the downtown moguls was they stole $400 million from us for South Ferry, so now we're going to steal back $400 million for the rail link. And that's nice. I, it's, it's incredible nice. that, that that's how po policy is determined, but it, it's true. It's almost like the inmates are truly running the mm -hmm. asylum and not, and, and not the riders. One sort of general question as we, as we begin to close, and then we're going to move on to next week's discussion. What's ahead for MTA riders? What in three years, in four years, am I going to see more fare hikes? Am I going to see more service cuts? Am I going to see fewer repairs? Well, I, I or am I going to give me some optimism well, here? The right? MTA gave, gave us some bad news. They, they said that they were going to cut service badly next year and raise the fare in 2007. Um, Control Alan Hevesy put out a report, said there's no need for service right. cuts. And there'll be a new governor. I, I, I don't know for sure. I'm not wired right. into it. But every, that's what the, the general wisdom is out there, whether it's Democrat or Republican. And they may feel a need uh, to, uh, to not start their tenure by having people socked with a fare increase. So, so my hope is that there won't be major service cuts next year. And then the NTA is warned of a fare hike in 2007, which would be, I mean, we're now getting them at a very rapid pace. And right. there are a lot of New Yorkers for whom it's a great hardship. Is the, has the Hevesy report had an impact beyond the confines of the, that's the good, cognoscenti, that's the a, inside that's baseball That's a good question. Folks. You know, uh, it, this is a kind of inside baseball answer, but the, in the old days, the bad old days, uh, when, before we sued the MTA over their financial practices in 2003, uh, they would issue a $8 billion budget on a Monday and approve it on a Wednesday. And it was larger than a whole bunch of states, and there was no way that you and could... You, countries in the U.N. There was no way you could absorb the information. Now, because we sued, and the big issue was their two sets of books and their financial uh, practices, uh, to the credit of Katie Lapp and Peter Calico, they put out a draft budget in July, and it's approved in December. So it's a sitting target for several months for people to understand and raise questions about it and, and be accountable. For example, the mayor, the first time they did it, they proposed cutting elevator operators and cleaners, and the mayor's people voted for it. So that's an issue. I just think they're going to have to say why. And closer to the election, this last time, they voted against the fair hike because that's just the politics right. of the situation. But they have voted for a lot of service cuts in their tenure on the board. Okay. Let's stop here. Okay. And we're coming back next week, and we're going to talk Jet Stadium, West Street Tunnel, Second Avenue Subway, commuter tax, photo ban, and toll booth closing. So. Okay. Stay tuned. Sounds good to me. Ah, 
by the New York subway. Love it or hate it, it's the only game in town. Subways are the great equalizer, no matter what your station in life. And when it comes to having an opinion about the subways, everyone wants to put in their two cents. Bucks, two bucks. It's dirty, it's nasty. That's very bad. But good about it is, I think it's two dollars fair. It's fair enough. It's a fair fair. Fair enough, fair. The service is terrible. Between the bus and underground, it's awful. There's nothing on time, they're not clean. It's just very bad service. Are you confused from this New York City map so far? Um, at the moment, yeah. Where do you want to go? We're going to go down to Brooklyn Bridge. Okay, Brooklyn Bridge, open it up, let's see. Okay. You take the H train, H. Okay. Are you getting your two dollars worth when you ride the subway? In general, the whole picture, yes. Because it moves millions of people every day, so they do pretty good when you consider the amount of people they move. Usually I buy the weekly Metro card, and I'm kind of upset that they raised it $2. I think that's kind of a jib. But otherwise, I mean, you know, it's a service that the city's providing, and I understand. On the weekends, they're always, there's always service changes, and that's really inconvenient, and I don't understand why they, you know, can have it work during the week, but not on the weekends. I think they should have it working on the weekends all the time. One dollar on the batteries. Will they be reassigning you out of this booth soon to walk around, or are you staying here? I'm staying here. Are you happy about that? Yes. I just feel it's a safer process, especially when someone's hurt or, or needs activation of the police or EMS and other serious issues going on. And if you're walking around with a burgundy jacket, you look like a maitre d' more than the... Yes, table for two? I'm not excited about that burgundy jacket. <laughs> H train. Mm -hmm. I'm just kidding you, there is no H train. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I like about the subways? Poetry in motion. Here's my contribution. <clears throat> I love to ride the subways. It's true, though you may scoff. I love to see the strap hangers rushing on and rushing off. Barry Mitchell for City Talk.